Transcriptomics 3 is a course dedicated to advanced methods of analysis that will allow us to find meaningful patterns in data, especially complex patterns that are present in big data sets. The course builds upon what we learned in Transcriptomics 1 and 2. In Transcriptomics 1, we learned how to convert raw reads from a next-generation sequencer into a table of expression, and then visualize it to develop a hypothesis. In Transcriptomics 2, we looked at statistical methods for determining differentially expressed elements that are present in known groups of samples. We explored the student's t-test, Bayesian methods such as DSEC and EDGE-R, as well as factor regression analysis to dissect the influence of multiple factors. Here, we will explore different methods for identifying groups of samples without prior knowledge, a process called clustering, and then examine methods for developing classification models from known samples in order to classify data in new samples. We will be using an example from the publication by Damon, among others. This is modeling precision treatment of breast cancer, which was featured in Genome Biology in 2013. This publication is interesting because the authors assembled a data set of about 50 different breast cancer cell lines that represent the whole spectrum of breast cancer variations. The cell lines have genomic, transcriptomic, and proteomic data, as well as an efficacy measurement of commonly used and experimental cancer drugs. This course will speak a lot about data mining, or the exploration and analysis of large data to discover meaningful patterns and rules. Data mining techniques are used to build machine learning models that power modern artificial intelligence applications, such as search engine algorithms and recommendation systems. The methods are an important part of big data analysis and are especially relevant to highly detailed biological data, data which has indeed been growing at an exponential rate. With unsupervised machine learning methods, we start with a data set, typically a table of elements, such as these shapes. We can use a clustering method, for example hierarchical clustering, which is a method that seeks to identify groups based on their similarities. Or we can use a dimensionality reduction method, such as principal component analysis, that will assign samples to groups of elements that are present. In some cases, we can use these results to draw other conclusions about the data within the structure. In this case, groups based on the shape of elements within the group. This is new information that this technique generates. One such approach is PCA that uses dimensionality reduction to show us what the data variability looks like. In PCA, we use the approach of principal components that explain variance in our data in the best possible way. Here is data with low variance. The samples are close together. And here is a sample set with higher variance. However, this variance is not well explained by the x and y axes but you could draw a line through the original space that shows the maximum variance of this data set. This vector through the multidimensional space that maximizes the variance of the data is called a principal component. And just like with the previous example, we can add other principal components, such as PC2 or even PC3, thus visualizing our data by projecting it into a space of two or three axes that explains some percentage of data variance. When we select the principal components that explain the most variance of our data, we can project all of our samples into this space and visualize the full data set. This technique is called principal component analysis, and it can be very helpful in the initial stages of our analysis. We can liken PCA to a photographer trying to find the best angle for a picture that will capture as much detail as possible while showing us the most information about the group as a whole. We would typically use this method to visualize as well as explore our data. When using this multivariate analysis method, it's important to play around with the data using normalization and filtering, while paying attention to outliers for the best possible interpretation. But PCA does not identify groups or their boundaries, and that's when we turn to clustering. There are many types of clustering, and hierarchical is one of the most popular approaches because it allows clustering on different levels. So let's say we have our samples organized in some space. Imagine a PCA 2D plot where samples are positioned in some perspective that best represents the data variability. The algorithm would find the two closest objects in this projection 
and then link them together. This is a cluster. Then, we would find the next two closest groups of two, where any two linked objects are considered as a single object, and their location is the center of that cluster. The algorithm will run until all objects are assigned to a cluster with all the objects in it. Hierarchical clustering is an example of an agglomerative or bottom-up clustering method that starts with attributing each sample to a separate cluster. It then finds the pair of most similar samples and unites them with one cluster that is further attributed as one quasi-sample. This procedure is repeated until coming into one cluster that contains all the samples. The pipeline will take the input, perform clustering, and put out the result in several formats we will discuss in a little bit. In this course, we will explore various types of clustering methods as well as their parameters to see what the differences are between them. We will also discuss how to best apply them to our RNA-seq data. Clustering is also widely used in data visualization to organize the patterns into heat maps so that we can visually see groups of samples as well as genes. We will also learn about several methods of supervised machine learning, which includes classification, a supervised analysis technique that relies on annotated or labeled data. Supervised machine learning takes in data that has been labeled. Typically, this is done by people. In biomedical projects, this could be clinical data or other phenotypic data. The labeled data is used to train a model, and the model is tested on a test data set. This data set will include examples of what is in the training data, but might also contain additional variation. The methods will vary, as do the principles used to build the model. For now, we can refer to them as a black box. The method is essentially to learn from the differences between various classes that are present in a training data set. Once this learning is established, you have a model, or a template, that can be applied to new data sets. New data will have to be assigned with a class that is present in the training data set. So if something does not fit the model, such as the star on the bottom right, model accuracy will be reduced. The output of classification algorithms include predicted classes for each object, or sample found in the data. Some algorithms, such as random forests, also evaluate how accurate and stable the prediction is. It does so by evaluating which features, if taken out, are the most significant for accuracy of the prediction. One such algorithm is called binary decision trees. Their output looks similar to hierarchical clustering, with each tree created by both thresholds and rules. Binary means the branch can either be yes or no. If the expression of the gene is higher than x, the classes will separate. The algorithm will continue until it has effectively separated all the samples into some group. Random Forest uses multiple instances of decision trees that are applied to portions of the data one at a time. After the analysis, the tree predictions are analyzed and majority voting is accepted. This algorithm is useful for more complex patterns, where smoother borders between classes are needed. It also gives an output of most significant features for classification. Another method we will look at is linear discriminant analysis, which is a method that is somewhat similar to PCA, but can separate groups into defined classes. It also allows certain flexibility for dealing with data variability. Another important method we will talk about are support vector machines. This algorithm differs from other classification methods because it is optimal to find boundary of a class. Additionally, it uses feature space transformation with a kernel function. This makes separation more efficient. For example, a circular class border can be achieved by a straight hyperplane if the space was curved in such a way that the classes are cut by a decision surface. These methods are commonly used in a variety of biomedical research, as well as clinical projects, where large data sets are beginning to be more and more available. These include patient stratification, disease classification, and mechanisms of both disease onset, as well as progression. On the pharma side, 
Biomarker discovery is an application for classification. Additionally, there are other classification applications, such as target discovery, as well as drug repurposing.